Hi friends, I'm Katie Brinkley and you're listening to Rocky Mountain Marketing. With nearly two decades helping business owners, consultants, and coaches with their digital marketing, I know that social media can be an incredible tool to grow your business when you know how to do it the right way. And that's what we're going to do today. I teach you how to navigate the world of entrepreneurship and digital marketing, and hopefully you'll grow your business with a few great tips you wouldn't have known otherwise, and maybe even discover a great local business you love. Let's dive in to today's episode. Welcome back to this week's episode of Rocky Mountain Marketing. I feel like in 2023, it has been the year of AI, but today's guest, I actually met way before AI was the big trending buzzword. And we were all in the world of NFTs, DAOs, you know, Web3. That is when I met this week's guest. And he's a well-renowned author. He's an international keynote speaker and consultant. And he is one of the co-authors of one of my favorite books. He is the co-author of the most amazing marketing book ever with Mark Schaefer and Epic Content Marketing with Joe Polizzi. Both of those books, if you're a marketing fanatic like yours truly, I've read both of them. In fact, I read the, your book with Epic Content Marketing with Joe Polizzi, and then I also listened to it on my drive to and from Steamboat because I go back and forth and that's like a three hour drive. So I listened to the book, absolutely love it. He has also been optimizing digital content since 1996 and has spent the last eight years focusing on data analytics, digital marketing, and content strategy. But today's guest, when he is not doing all things digital marketing, he is a wingsuit skydiving instructor and spends time with his wife and six kids Today's guest is none other than Brian Piper. Brian, thank you so much for joining me on Rocky Mountain Marketing today. Well, thank you so much for having me, Katie. It's a pleasure. Before we hit record here, we were kind of catching up on all things life and you live out in New York. The last time I actually got to see you was at CEX back in May of 2023. And that was right when your book with Joe Polizzi was coming out, Epic Content Marketing. And I, like I said, I actually read the book twice, once by listening and once by using my actual eyes, but you are a, a huge writer. Like you've had a hand in some of these really big marketing books about content marketing. How did you get involved with being, being such a, a writer for, for digital marketing? Yeah, I was actually a writer, like a creative writing major in college and a philosophy minor. I wasn't really sh exactly sure how I was going to use those skills <laughs> in real jobs. I was kind of ready to wait tables for the rest of my life, but I got into website development, weird back end way into developing websites. I worked with a great team of developers who were very talented. I wasn't that talented and I wasn't <laughs> that passionate about website development. So they'd often put me on the content side of things and say, well, just take this content and make it better for the users and make it good for search engines. And so that really kind of led me into different ways to optimize content and write content for search and for users readability. I've primarily done that for big institutions and done a lot of training programs throughout the years and then read Epic Content Marketing, the first edition, when it came out back in 2013, and was immediately said, I gotta leave the web development, I gotta go into <laughs> marketing and figure out how to use this content marketing. I went right down to the vice president of marketing and said, you have to hire me to be your digital marketing manager, because no one knew what content marketing was at the time. So she did, I was able to use content marketing for that institution and make some great changes for them and double their website traffic every year. And that led right into my job with the University of Rochester, where I do very similar work. I look at all the data around all of our content and figure out how to optimize the performance, how to make sure we're reaching the right audience, we're converting, that everything's working right. And started speaking at different events, higher ed events and content events. Every year I went to Content Marketing World, I would track Joe down, 
I would tell him what an impact the book had on my life and my career and thank him. And then after doing that for six or seven years and, and starting to speak at Content Marketing World, I started bugging him about when he was going to do a second edition. It's like, when do you, you know, it's still, you know, Google Plus in there, all these <laughs> old things. You got to update this. So finally he said, well, co-author it with me and we'll do it. And that kind of launched my actual solo writing for myself career. It's been fantastic. I love it. Well, and I love the fact that you're here for today's episode to talk about data. I feel like such a nerd because I get so excited when I'm looking at the, the metrics, when I look at the data to see what's working and what's not working because our time is valuable and it's limited. How can you get in and make an impact with the content you're creating and spend less time having to do it because you know that this is the formula that works. Data shows that this works and it brings in business. So we're going to talk about that today with your background and what you currently do. How important is looking at our insights, is looking at our data when we're creating content? Well, I think it's critically important. Like you said, time is our most valuable asset. If we're spending our time creating content that doesn't deliver, we're wasting our time. I always tell our content creators, if you spend 15 minutes before you start writing, doing some keyword research, and then you spend four hours writing, you could reach a hundred times, a thousand times more people with your content than if you don't do that. So it's well worth it to do some research, to see what questions people are asking about the content you're writing, to see what conversations are going on, to see what's trending, and to look at all of that data and figure out how you can put all the right information that people are trying to get and they're trying to figure it out into that content that you're already working on. So you're already doing the research, you've already got the idea, you already know what the story is. Now you just need to make sure that you're answering the questions that people are asking. And then once you put it out there, then you've got to watch it to see mm -hmm. what you're starting to rank for and how people are finding you and which people are finding you and then actually converting and coming and using your products or your services, or they're coming back to revisit you or subscribe to your newsletter. And all of that you can only find if you start looking at your data. A lot of the small companies that I work with and the smaller institutions are like, well, we don't have enough data. It's like, I have enough data as an individual <laughs> content creator to at least go look and see what posts are performing well, what blog entries are performing, what's driving more visitors, how are they finding me? What are they searching on to find me? How can I write more content about that? So data is critical. When you're looking at this data, you said, just looking for the keywords, what's my audience asking? What questions are they asking before you go ahead and create that content? That goes back to, I feel step one of knowing who it is Absolutely. that you're talking to. No, who is it that you're creating the content for? Because if you're creating it for yourself, unless you're your target audience, it's really not going to do anything for you. Exactly. What are your tips in guiding people to knowing how to figure out and get inside their head of their target audience? Yeah, well, and like you said, I have a content optimization model that I use. It's a framework. It's a process that I use anytime I'm doing content optimization for any kind of content, whether it's your website or your podcast or your blogs. And you have to start off very consciously focusing on, focusing on your strategic goals. You have to know where you're going, what your destination is, what you're trying to accomplish. That's first. Then you have to know who you're talking to, who can actually help you reach those goals? Who can you have take some action from your content to help you reach your goals? Then you have to start looking at what are their concerns? What are their problems? What questions are they ans asking? And then how can you answer those questions and provide the best answers for those questions? There's some great like free tools and free websites out there. Answerthepublic.com is one of my favorites. You can just go there type in a topic, it'll tell you all sorts of questions that people are asking about that topic. You know, Google has the people also ask questions in there. If you're writing or if you're researching a topic that you're going to write about, 
go look at the questions that are being asked about that topic and figure out a better way to answer them than the, than the answers that are already there and given. And now, with AI, the search generative experience, they're looking for different ways to find your content, and discoverability is going to be a changing landscape for us over the next few years. So it's important to get good content out there now that answers the questions that people are asking and solves the problems that your customers have. And that's the fundamentals of content marketing, is giving away your information and giving away your advice so that people see you as a trusted source, and then they're going to keep coming back to you. And when they're finally ready to spend their money or buy some products or use your services, they're going to come to you because they trust you and they know that you are looking out for them and you can provide them the right answers. I'm glad that you talked about Answer the Public and then just the good old Google search bar. I write a weekly blog, and a lot of times when I'm just trying to find topics, I'll just go right on into the, the Google search bar and I'll say, what is Instagram and see what else Google su suggests for me to say on it. Yep. Google Trends is another great place to go see what are people talking about right now. Let me get in on these conversations that are happening right now and create some content around those. Quora, Reddit, go look at what people are talking about. See those conversation threads that are going on. Write some content about that stuff. You know, it wouldn't be 2023 if we didn't say something about AI here. Uh, let's talk about how we're seeing AI it change the way that we are creating content. Are you using any sort of prompts or AI platforms in particular to help find research to create co trending content? Every day, I use three to four AI tools at least three to four AI tools every day in one capacity or another. It's changed my entire workflow. It helps me so much with any sort of writer's block. If you're stumped on something, you can just go say, hey, ChatGPT, give me 15 ideas about this right now, and it'll generate those for you. It's constantly learning. They're constantly training it. I use Perplexity AI to do all my research because it cites sources. It gives you links. It's very much more reliable as a research tool than ChatGPT is, but ChatGPT is great for conversational, for idea generating, for coming up with outlines. And then I'm in mid-journey every day, playing with different images for slides, for presentations. I just did a bunch of photo editing in the new Photoshop beta where you can so easily crop things out from the background and you can remove people from pictures and it's so much faster and so much easier than the manual way we used to have to do it with the copy and paste and the rubber stamp. And we're going to see this in all the tools we're using. We're already seeing Google's Duet and Microsoft's Pilot. Photoshop has Firefly. All these tools that we use every day are going to have AI integrated into them. So we need to start learning and understanding how the prompting works and how to get better content out of your prompts by really giving it good details and answering the questions that it needs to have answered. As a marketer, should I be worried about my job? Should I be worried about a robot taking over my job? And as a business owner, should I even try to have some sort of a marketing team anymore with AI being so, I, I want to say smart, like every day it is just doing things that it wasn't doing a week ago and, and then three months ago. And is it because we're getting smarter with these tools or is the machine getting so smart that soon enough we are going to be like ready player one here? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so yes to all of that. As a marketer, should we be worried about AI taking our jobs? If you create content that is unremarkable, that is easily generated, that a tool could write and generate for you, yes, you should be worried about your job. But if you are strategic, if you are creative, if you have a lot of different ideas and perspectives and stories and experience, AI is not going to replace you, but AI is going to make it so much easier for you to create content. You can take, like Claude 2, you can load a 
whole bunch of your already existing content into there, and then it can start writing content in the same voice as you. It makes it much easier and faster for you to cre exponentially increase your amount of output or just to decrease the amount of time that it takes you to create the work that you're creating now. For small businesses that are doing marketing, doing their own marketing, or using an agency to do their marketing, now is the time to start playing with these tools and figure out what processes you can automate, where you can take AI and integrate it into your workflow to make you more efficient, because we're going to end up being able to do more with fewer people, or we're going to be able to do exponentially more with the same number of people that we have now if they're all learning how to use AI and they're all looking at tools that they can use to optimize their workflow. Because there's a lot of times where you can go down rabbit holes with these tools and you can spend an hour or two playing with a tool and not actually figure out how it's going to help you do your job better. But so many of these tools can be huge time savers and they can free you up to do the creative stuff, to do the strategic stuff and really think about the big picture things that AI just can't do yet. I 100% agree with AI and especially like ChatGPT. Like I love that you brought up Claude. Claude is one of my, my favorite tools, but like ChatGPT, if I'm going in there and saying, hey, what are some common questions that people are asking about Instagram? They're going all the way back to 2021. Those aren't common questions that people are asking about Instagram today. So this is where having some sort of a system, some sort of a timeline for creating your content is necessary. Right now, do you have some sort of a timeline that you use to create your trending content while also using ChatGPT or any sort of AI tool? Or for now, do we need to have of actual human involved in the content creation process. Yeah, you absolutely need humans involved. You need humans to edit. You need humans to actually make sure that the voice is right. If you tell ChatGPT to be funny, it's going to try, but it's not <laughs> always going to work. You need a human to look through. Like, you can tell ChatGPT, give me 50 clever, engaging, easy-to-read headlines that will grab a user and act like a editorial expert and have it generate all these great headlines. But if you look through them, you need to really come from a human perspective and figure out which ones are going to be more effective for my particular audience, which ones will ladder up to my strategies and my goals that I'm trying to reach. So you definitely need the human involvement in this whole process. Now's the time where we all need to start understanding what these different tools can do, where you're going to use tools. There's some tools like I'll use Bing and Perplexity to start off like doing research and to get ideas about what's out there currently on the web. Then I'll use ChatGPT to help like refine the style of writing, to make it more conversational or to shorten it up a little bit or to lengthen it. Then I'll take everything that I generate from all the different AI tools and then I'll create my actual content. I'll take parts and pieces and say, oh, yeah, this outline, I like the way that it's organizing things. I'll use that outline. I'll add in some more things here. I'll take this line here and use it. So it's kind of very copy and paste at this point and massaging and changing so that it's in your voice. You integrate your stories into your content, personalize it to the audience that you're talking to. But it gets away, it, it, it removes writer's block from the equation because you can always have it generate something and be like, oh, okay, I can take something from there. That'll spark me on this new path. Yeah. And yeah, and, and that's just the generative AI when you start looking at things like AutoGPT and Zapier and how they're integrating AI into things. You're going to be able to just go tell your AI assistant when this email comes in, write responses and send them to me so I can review them before you send them out and add these people into our CRM and take these people and make them sales prospects. And it'll just put things in the right data storage systems and into the right tools. And it's going to automate a lot of these tasks that typically take us a long time to do. And man, you said all that, like, oh, respond to these emails and do that. I was like, oh, man, I would love to have that already set up that zap if zapier is already creating some sort of automation between these two that would be a, 
a dream come true for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're integrating generative AI into Zapier. So you're going to be able to go in and just give it access to all your accounts. And you're going to say, when someone reads my newsletter and signs up for them, add them to my CRM and send them my first drip campaign and monitor them on yeah. social to see what they're posting. It's going to automate a lot of this and make it easy for us to just tell it how to automate it. And coding is going to get this way as well. We're not going to need to know JavaScript and Python to be able, we're just going to tell our AI assistant, write me a program that'll do this and it'll build it for you. Oh man, this is where it's exciting. It's very exciting, but it's kind of scary too. This is where I feel as marketers, as business owners, if we're not at least trying to dabble in it, try and stay up to date on the latest trends with it, we are going to get left behind. And whether it's by another person that knows more of prompts and more ways of integrating this, or if it's us getting left behind because the AI has gotten so smart, we will, I guess, like unlearn our way out of a job. I, I don't know. We have to be learning all of this. Yeah, absolutely. If you're not at least educating yourself about the capabilities of AI and the way that we interact with AI. Prompting is gonna be a whole, I mean, there are already prompt engineer jobs out there. I think that's gonna go away because it's just gonna become so conversational. We're just mm -hmm. gonna learn how to get what we need out of these different AI tools. And that's gonna yeah. be a whole skill set. Is Now public speaking is a skill set. Well, AI speaking is gonna be a skill set, so. Yeah, oh man, it's an exciting time to, to be alive. One thing that I've seen in 2023, like I said, it's been the year of AI. You know, 2021 was the year of NFTs, Web3. I fully believe the NFTs have a strong spot in business and in our lives. I'm a season ticket holder for the Colorado Avalanche. I feel like if they were NFTs, it would make way more sense, especially with all the Ticketmaster drama. Is AI just kind of going to be kind of a passing fad or have NFTs and the whole Web3, the metaverse, just kind of taken a back burner to this AI wave? Yeah, I think we're seeing big hype cycles around both of these new technologies. We see that a lot with new technologies. It comes out and suddenly it becomes widespread enough within public perception that everyone's like, this is the big thing, we have to use it, this is the way we use it. And that's what happened with NFTs. Everybody was like, oh, well, these are these great JPEGs that you can buy, and the value's just going up exponentially. But that, you know, that hype cycle burst, and now we're getting to the point where people are actually using NFTs and the blockchain for practical purposes, for things that are really gonna make sense, that are gonna better leverage that technology and allow us to control our own data and control access to our information and change our privacy settings ourselves. I think AI is actually going to increase the number of opportunities for blockchain, especially we're looking for attribution and ownership as a huge conversations that are going on with AI as it's scraping all this content and not citing any sources and not giving any ownership to where those ideas came from. Well, if all of our content was marked with our blockchain digital identity and that was tied to our content somehow, these AI tools would know where they scraped this information from and they would be able to cite all the sources. And then if AI generated some content and put it out and said it was yours, you'd be able to point at it and say, no, it doesn't have my digital identity tied to it. It's not my content. So that would be a way that we could start disproving some of these deep fakes. And we're gonna see more and more of these, especially during the election next year. It's gonna get nuts if we don't figure out a way to identify what content is real and what's not and what is actually being created by these different creators. Look at all of the AI-generated books that are going up on Amazon and being oh distributed gosh, right? now. A lot of them are using names of actual authors who do have books out already, and it's writing books just like them, but they're not getting any of the royalties or, you know. You've written a couple books, and I just wrote my first book, and I've 
by the time I finished it, I was like, gosh, I could have had this done so much longer ago if I just would have used AI. If AI was around, maybe it was right. still around then, but I just didn't know how to use it and do the prompts. But I guess there's like definitely a little bit more pride and ownership since I actually yes. did write it. Yes, but absolutely. <laughs> Pre-AI books and post-AI yeah. books. Yeah. With AI content creation, you were talking deep fakes. At the time of this recording, there's more and more businesses and companies and schools that are banning the use of ChatGPT or AI tools. What do you think on that? Is it a bad move by these businesses to limit bringing in this super smart computer to help? What are your opinions on it? Yeah, we're seeing this a lot in higher education and in schools in general. A lot of schools, a lot of teachers are saying, no, you cannot use these products. A lot of businesses are saying, no, you can't use these within our company. I think that is absolutely the wrong philosophy, the wrong strategy to employ. I think what schools and businesses need to be doing right now is educating people on how to use these tools. Because we're going to open up Word tomorrow within the next few days and we're going to see a help me write this button it will just help you generate content and if you're not trained on how to write prompts or how to get good content people are going to be creating horrible content they're not going to understand that they shouldn't put sensitive company information into these ai programs unless they're specifically designed for internal company use so yeah, I think education is where we need to be focusing our time right now for these businesses, educational institutions. Teachers need to be teaching their students how to use these technologies to help them be better, create more accurate content to learn faster in different ways. I think we're definitely going to see a lot of changes. We're going to see a lot of governance policies. We're going to see a lot of AI institutional AI usage policies. All right, sir. Marketing AI Institute have a fantastic uh, podcast episode they did recently all about how to use these AI systems within companies and within businesses and within schools and some of the conversations that are going on around that. But I, I think banning is the wrong move. It's like telling people they couldn't use calculators when calculators came out. It's a tool. We have to learn how to use these tools. We're not all still using hand saws and hammers. We've got better yeah. tools. So, okay, this will be a, kind of my final question. It's not in regards to creating content in a social media business owner sort of way, but if we're allowing these schools to continue using ChatGPT, Claude, any of anything, uh, perplexity that you know that you mentioned earlier. So if we are allowing them to use it, what's to say that somebody could have the education required that typically happens when you write a dissertation or you write your final senior seminar presentation or anything? If you just are like, okay, well, I'm just going to do the prompts, look over it, that looks good. Now I'm graduating from college. Yeah, Ann Handley had a great discussion about this. Is the people this, are, this is going to hurt the most are people who don't know how to write. So they're not going to learn. They're not going to build those muscles of how to create, how to tell a story, how to craft a message. And they're just going to rely on the AI for that. We're going to need to change the way we teach. We're going to need to change the way we evaluate our students, our employees, because we know they can just go generate this content. We're going to have to get much more into conversations, discussions, debates. It's going to have to be a much more personal way to interact and gauge someone's knowledge so that you don't think that they just went out and generated it with AI. Right now, there are AI detectors out there that will program. You can run things through to see if they were created by AI, but they're not accurate. They don't consistently work and they will flag things that were not AI generated and they won't flag things that were AI generated. There's no good process to really figure out whether or not content was AI generated. We need to figure out how to leverage our training, our testing, and kind of our knowledge transfer measurements that we're using now and change those so that they will allow us to use all these tools that we have at our disposal. 
Oh, Brian, this has been such a fun conversation. If people want to learn more about you, see you speak at one of your upcoming events or, or just get in touch with you, what's the best, best way for them to do that? Come to brianwpiper.com. I have a weekly newsletter that I send out uh, with one content marketing, content optimization tip every week. You can reach me on any social channel at Brian W. Piper, or feel free to email me if you ever want to talk data, analytics, Web3, AI. I love it. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining me on Rocky Mountain Marketing today. This has been a great conversation. Thank you, Katie. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode of Rocky Mountain Marketing. Make sure to subscribe so that you can continue navigating the world of entrepreneurship. And I'd love to hear from you please leave the show a review and connect with me on social media. You can find me on Instagram at I am Katie Brinkley or connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you're ready to start making some sales on social media, be sure to grab my free guide to selling in the DMs without being spammy. You can get that at katiebrinkley.com. Let's keep taking your marketing to all new heights.